Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cancer Research Foundation's first adventure into virtual events. Um, I'm very excited tonight because I'm finally able to wear my sport jacket after over six months of not dressing up, so it's wonderful to be with all of you tonight. And uh, extremely pleased to have Dr. Sam Volchenbaum presenting this evening. Thank you, Sam. Um, my name is Matt Johnson, and I am the CEO of Cancer Research Foundation, and I've been with CRF for about six months now. And I'm really excited to be a part of such an amazing organization at this time of their history. For those of you who may not know much about CRF, um, Cancer Research Foundation is all about supporting early career researchers and novel ideas in cancer research with the hope of contributing to transformative events in the prevention, treatment, and cures of cancer. We make early investments in ideas that are often very difficult to fund through traditional sources, high risk, high reward type investments. And we wanna grow. We wanna grow to support more young investigators, more Fletcher scholars, um, and more cancer researchers overall so that there's a greater probability for those transformative events. So I'm really excited to be here and be here with you tonight. Before I pass it to um, Zana, I'd like to thank the board members of Cancer Research Foundation who are here tonight, um, as well as all of the attendees. We hope you continue to stay connected with us after this event. We've got a few more events coming up um, the rest of the fall, which we'll share with you. Um, and we're grateful for you to be here tonight. As a reminder, there's a, a Q&A button on the toolbar at the bottom. If you have a question of Sam at any time during his presentation, just type it in and we'll get to a few of those at the end of the presentation. And we're recording this event in case you wanna share this with your friends or uh, view it again, we'll share it after we're finished. And with that, I'd like to introduce Zana Nikitas, who is the uh, Cancer Research Foundation Board Chair to introduce Dr. Ochenbaum. Dana? Thanks, Matt. And, uh, and thank you everyone for being here this afternoon. Um, and thank you, Sam, for coming and speaking to us. As uh, many of you know, I think most of you are familiar with Sam and his work. He's an expert in pediatric cancers and blood disorders. He has a particular interest in treating children with neuroblastoma, which is a tumor of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, he's an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Chicago and is the associate director of the Institute for Translational Medicine at the University of Chicago, among many other titles. Um, Sam was a Cancer Research Foundation young investigator in 2008, which was my, one, my inaugural full year. Um, he used that award to study uh, neuroblastoma using quantitative proteomics. That was uh, a long, we've come a long way to now talk about the Pediatric Cancer Data Commons, which is a project the CRF was pleased to make a pledge, a three-year pledge to support particularly interested in bringing international partners into the PCDC. Um, Sam can speak of this with far more authority than I can, so I'm gonna pass it over to him. Thank you, Sam. Great, thanks, thanks, Anna. And um, let me get my slides up so I can start. Go. How's that look, Matt? Everything okay? That looks good. So, you know, I've known, um, Zana has been, uh, was very sweet in her introduction. I've known Zana for, um, you know, I guess about 12 years now. And, and she was a early and enthusiastic supporter of this, uh, you know, this guy who just moved to Chicago <laughs> and finished his fellowship. And I was so grateful for the interest that she's taken in my career. And it's, I've come such a long way. And it's through uh, the kind of support that, that, uh, that, your group provides that allows young investigators to turn into old investigators. Um, and so I'm just continually um, uh, grateful for, for the support that Santa has shown along the way. And I think as you're going to see tonight, uh, the support from CRF and other groups like CRF are just instrumental in, in creating this new way of thinking about research data. 
I'm going to give a relatively short talk. So I usually give a 45 minute or an hour long talk. This is hopefully going to just be a 15 minute talk so that we have plenty of time for discussion. And so I've tried to distill uh, my longer data commons talk down to just uh, some important highlights that I want to make sure that you're aware of. Obviously, studying pediatric cancer is um, is difficult. Uh, thankfully, pediatric cancer is rare. It's only 1% of the total cancers that we see. Uh, it, it's, um, there's something like, uh, uh, you know, 15 million uh, uh, adults will be diagnosed with cancer this year in the United States and only about 15,000 kids. So thankfully rare, but at the same time, um, makes it more, more difficult to study and more difficult to collect, uh, to collect good data. And that's what we're really going to be talking about today. You know, my motivation is actually at an even higher level. We're trying to fix some really bad processes. Uh, in the middle, there's a, a, a set of paper records. This is, how we, uh, this is how we track adverse events on our patients with handwritten notes that are faxed back to the children's oncology group often. Uh, on the right is a, a calendar that would be produced in Microsoft Word. This is, this is how a, a parent would know which chemotherapy to give their kids. They would give them this, um, this generic looking printed calendar. Uh, on the left are, are a bunch of laptops that are each connected to a different pharmaceutical company's proprietary data entry system. You can see the usernames and passwords taped to the front there, and this that's how that's how clinical research assistants would enter the data into the into these systems. Uh, so this it's very broken. Um, I, I liken it to the analogy of the of the uh, cash machine. So re remember, well, I'm probably one of the few here that are old enough to remember, but it used to be when you wanted to get cash out of an ATM, you'd have to go to an ATM that was just for your bank. It'd have to have your bank's name on the top. And if you tried to go to a different one, your card didn't work. Uh, imagine that now. Now you can walk up in almost any country to any ATM, put your card in, you get cash out. And that's because the banks early on figured out, like, we need to be speaking the same language. We need to interoperate. And in many ways, medicine is still caught back in this 1990s mentality of not being able to interoperate with their data. And we're really trying to change that paradigm. We're trying to bring attention to these important concepts. Here's another great example of what can happen if you don't have standards for your data. This is from one of our main repositories of genomic data called the Gene Expression Omnibus or GEO. And, and, and we look through here, these are all the different ways that age is represented. Age lowercase, age uppercase, age in years, uh, age with different spelling of years and hyphens. Imagine trying to do an analysis over multiple sets of data where you just wanna compare ages and you can't even get um, you can't even get harmony between the different ways that they say age. Now imagine how this is over genetic defects, over lab values, over medications. The problem is just enormous, and that's because there's been a pervasive lack of standards for so many years. So we're building data commons, and a data commons is really a, a, a it's really easy to think of it as a cloud-based infrastructure where all the data go, but it's not just the data, it's the tools to analyze the data, it's the data that are connected to each other. And we want to try to do away with researchers having to download all the data to their own computers, uh, with having to have their own experts right on hand to do the analytics. We want it all to be in a cloud-based infrastructure where people can log in, the data are already there, they're connected to the tools and analytics that they need. This is really the way that, uh, the, way that the world is moving because you can't download terabytes of data, of genomic data anymore, it just takes too long. And so you have to have a cloud-based infrastructure to do this. If you're successful at building a data commons, you can do all sorts of cool things that you just can't do with a small set of data. Uh, you can look at correlations on um, how biomarkers look across clinical trials. You can figure out better ways to, to do risk stratification, uh, could, uh, determine whether patients are uh, better ways to look for early response after treatment, look for uh, early signs of failure. There's so many cool things you can do if you take an even larger set of data. And as I'm gonna explain to you, uh, not just over one disease, but over many diseases. And that's really what we're looking at today is the is, is idea of having a very large data commons with many different types of cancer data in it. You know, we're very passionate about, about building our data commons. We, we, we really work hard to develop these international consortia. We, we get experts from all over the world to agree that we need to build a commons and what scientific questions we're gonna ask. Uh, we spend an enormous amount of time on data governance uh, and there's no end to the meetings we have about data sharing and data co contributor agreements. Uh, and we spend a lot of time um, putting in a memoranda of understanding about how these consortia are gonna work. And then the real bread and butter of our group is this data dictionary development and transforming and aggregating the data into that common language. 
And of course, you know, it's really important to think about sustainability. And when I first started um, working on these types of projects, no one talked about sustainability. They just would give you a grant and that was the end of it. Now I'm asked every single time when I'm writing a grant, what is your sustainability plan? How are you gonna keep supporting this after the initial, initial funding runs out? And so thinking about sustainability has become a really important part of the work that we do. As Dana mentioned, we started with, uh, my interest was in neuroblastoma and, and much of the reason I came to University of Chicago was to work with Sue Cohn, one of the international experts in neuroblastoma. And she really helped, uh, helped me with this idea of setting up a data commons for neuroblastoma. They had collected uh, um, almost 10,000 patients from around the world uh, and they had put the data into a common language, but it was all stuffed in Excel. It was on somebody's laptop and you, you really, uh, had trouble accessing it, um, and they had written a lot of good papers from the data, but it really wasn't um, wasn't easily accessible. So we did something which um, uh, makes a lot of sense now, but may have been a little bit um, uh, crazy to think of in uh, 2015, which was we put the data in a in a, a publicly available database. So all of a sudden now we have 21,000 patients in this database. Anybody in the world can access it. Uh, that that. That URL there is publicly accessible uh, and you can go in and you can look at counts of patients. If you want to know how many patients in the database have high risk disease that are over the age of 10, you can find that out now in 10 seconds and that would have taken you a long time before because you would have had to know all sorts of different people to get that question answered. The other really cool thing we're doing is we're connecting to external data sources. So we can actually now connect to the tissue bank and for all the patients that are children's oncology group patients, we can tell you which patients have tissue in the tissue bank. So if you wanna study high risk patients with amplification of the NMIC gene, you can immediately see how many patients have tissue in the tissue bank to study. That would have taken you days or weeks before. Now you can do it in minutes. And if you wanna actually get the raw data, you can apply for the data through a, a path that we have defined on the website. This is the simplest example of a data commons and now we're building it to extend it to include analytics tools, images, uh, and all sorts of other types of data connections that are gonna make this even more useful. The, the um, funding has been really hard to come by traditionally for infrastructure projects. And we tried applying for all sorts of governmental grants and uh, the NCI just wasn't interested over the past few years in funding what they called infrastructure or technology uh, to, to, serve the, to serve up these data. Now that viewpoint has changed, but in the meantime, we were only able to get our work off the ground through these types of uh, foundation grants. And it was through uh, multiple small injections of funds, you know, the, the 20, the 40, the 50, the $75,000 grants that uh, enabled us to really start building this. And it's turned into something very, very big now. And uh, it's, turned into, um, uh, it's turned into a program where we're actually generating, you know, sometimes uh, millions of dollars in funding now to help propel these data commons forward. This is our current dashboard of the work that we're doing. And so you can see we've moved far beyond neuroblastoma. You know, we're, we're looking at eight different tumor types now and we're adding more all the time. Uh, we've, we've got international buy-in from not just the US and Europe, but we have some groups working in Central and South America, from India, uh, uh, from, from Japan, and we're hoping to engage a larger slice of the Asian, uh, Asian um, patient population. We've built, um, in many cases, some very complex data dictionaries through multiple meetings, uh, international conferences, conferences and phone calls and Zooms. Uh, we have um, uh, helped set up these international consortia. We've been taking in more and more data and it's resulting in more analytics and more papers being published. So we're really seeing the impact of this work now. Uh, there was just another paper published yesterday by the sarcoma group based on the data commons that we built for them. So this is continuing to grow. Our next big uh, area that we want to add on is uh, brain tumors. And so we have some ideas and some funding to get started with certain types of brain tumors. And then we're hoping to move to, um, to retinoblastoma um, as well to study eye tumors. Uh, this is our view of the data commons. You know, we see ourselves as having um, our data commons all interconnected. We want the user to come in and just see an entry point where they can search over all the data at once. You know, why should you restrict yourself to just searching over ALL or just searching over bone tumors? We want you to be able to search over all the different tumors and to see all the kids that have certain aspects in common and be able to search over all the data and then request the data. So we're, we're building this inter, intersecting, interacting group of data commons. And then, as I said, it's really important to hook out to other types of data. We wanna to connect to the, all the new 
uh, data commons, genomic commons, uh, imaging commons that are being set up there. And so this, this um, vision is just starting to come to fruition. And over the next year, you're going to see the emergence of, of, our, of our new platforms for doing this type of searching. Uh, we have um, we have some very important guiding principles for us. You know, the main thing that we want to do is lower the barriers to research. We want researchers to have access to data, uh, and it's really important to have stakeholder and contributor approval for using the data. One thing we learned early on is that nobody is going to give you their data to put in your comments if you can't promise them that you're going to take good care of it and that you're not going to give it away without them knowing who's seeing the data or that they have some approval process. So we spend a lot of time reassuring groups, putting agreements in place so that data are released only under certain conditions and then published only with certain types of recognition. And then of course, we've had to work through all the regional differences in HIPAA and GDPR and all the different ways of sharing data, which has, which has really blown me away at how complex it is. Um, just trying to share data between, um, uh, between Germany and the US, for instance, we, you know, it took almost a year to get a data sharing agreement in place with, uh, with one of the hospitals because of all of the, all of the onerous regulations of the GDPR. I'm um, going to finish up with just a little bit about our nas national uh, data commons ecosystem. So this is a, a figure that's prepared by the National Cancer Institute. And here's that cloud, here's that data commons. And, and these cylinders in here represent all the interacting data commons that are being built now. The proteomics commons, the genomics commons, which is up and running, actually was built at University of Chicago, the, the GDC as it's known, the genomic data commons, the imaging commons. And you know, as far as a clinical trials or clinical commons goes, we see ourselves as fitting into the structure very neatly. Included in this cloud are things like visualization tools, com computing um, resources, um, access to all the data dictionaries that are being built and better ways to query the data. And then on the bottom here are all the different users, the patients, the doctors, the scientists, and all the different ways that they can access the data under very rigid authentication methods and that they can only be authorized to see the data that they're supposed to see. So this is the, the vision of the National Cancer Institute. Um, our group has been really recognized for the work we're doing in pediatric cancer so much that, that we were part of a winning bid to build this, uh, this National Center for Cancer data harmonization that, that we won with, uh, um, with Oregon Health Sciences University. This is a, a multi-year, multi-million dollar grant to actually build the tools that's going to allow these data commons to talk to each other. And it's, all, it's because of the work that we've been doing in building community and building data dictionaries and building tools that we were selected to help take a leadership role in this effort. And so it's actually going to feed right back into the work we're doing. In fact, we just found out last week that we were given a government contract uh, 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 it was in excess of a million dollars now to uh, integrate our pediatric uh, dictionaries into this national infrastructure. So again, it's just reaffirming the work that we're doing and reaffirming that we're on the right track and that we're set to be part of this really important national effort, which has come out of um, this Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. It's this $50 million a year effort now that's being put into pediatric cancer. So for, for me, it's, it's all about collaboration and sharing, and you really have to be able to put large sets of data together to get this work done. We really try to get the trust and the consensus of the groups we work with so that we can put these different kinds of data together. We really want to enrich the kind of research we can do. Standards are our bread and butter, and it's not an exciting or sexy topic, but man, without data standards, we can't do much. And so we spend so much time working on that. And we're really trying to push the early adoption of standards. So the next person that builds a form for a clinical trial will use the standards that we built so that their clinical trial will collect the data in the same standard so that we can all share it uh, and share the data and have it aggregated together. Our team is, has really grown. I think we're up to 16 people now, and, and, and it's, we're made up of programmers and project managers. Uh, we have data standards experts. We, hired, we just hired somebody. We're hiring somebody that has a title of an ontologist, not an oncologist, but an ontologist, so a data specialist who understands how to do this kind of data standardization as a science. Uh, and we're still hiring more people because we have uh, more and more projects that are coming online. So it's a really exciting time for our group. Um, uh, uh, COVID has devastated so many different types of research labs, but for us, we've been able to just push even harder because for us working remotely is, is, is not difficult since all of our work is virtual, all of our work is online, and uh, we do miss seeing each other in person, but uh, we had a we had a four hour retreat yesterday on Zoom and uh, it was okay and it wasn't as fun. And so our picture doesn't look like this. It looks like a giant Brady Bunch picture, but it's still, uh, it's still some camaraderie in the group.
And then of course, like I, like I said at the outset, it's the, it's the support of the Cancer Research Foundation and the Rally Foundation and, and Sammy Superheroes and the Bitkers that have given us these wonderful seed grants to get these things off the ground. And then, you know, last week we announced the $500,000 Brightside gift to build a, le a leukemia commons. We just signed a multi-million dollar contract with St. Baldrick's to build, uh, to build this enormous AML um, uh, trial matching uh, commons. And then of course the, uh, um, the I mean, the, um, sorry, the, the deal with St. Baldrick's is to build uh, extended data commons and then the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is funding this big AML effort to build the world's largest leukemia commons. And none of this would have happened without these really important foundational um, uh, grants that we've gotten that have really led, uh, let, uh, let us um, get these things kicked off. Uh, and, and so I just, you know, I talked to Zana and Matt earlier in the week about this. It's none of this would have happened without the kind of input that we've received from these groups. And I gotta be honest, like for me, very little of this would have happened if I hadn't had the support early on from, from CRF and Xana and, and groups like that and helping support my research. So I'm extremely grateful. So um, that was almost exactly uh, 15, 18 minutes and hopefully we can um, answer some questions. I've, I've only had on full screen here, Matt, so I have not been reading questions. Uh, so I'm going to stop my share and I'm assuming there's not a million questions. There's exactly zero, I think. <laughs> Um, which is fine because we'll have a discussion, but I'm sure uh, Zana is going to kick things off for us here. Sure. So, so thank you, first of all, again, for being here and talking about this project. Um, and, you know, it's something I know you've worked on, uh, on for a, a long time. You and I have had many conversations about why pediatrics is a particularly good lever for cancer research in general. Can you give a little background on that? And then we're starting to hear about how your work is actually pushing other groups and larger groups to, to move mm -hmm. their data into similar kinds of, con uh, of configurations. Could you give us a little color on that? Yeah, so um, one thing that's really uh, been gratifying about pediatric cancer research is that um, it's just a very, it's a very tight-knit small community. So if you want to have if we want to have an international meeting to bring all the experts in osteosarcoma together, that's a 40 person meeting. You know, you can have that in one room um, and you can't do that with the breast cancer meeting, right? I mean, that would be thousands of people. So it's, it's a much different feeling when you, when you do one of these initiatives because you can actually get consensus. So, it, you know, we, with, with osteosarcoma and with, with soft tissue sarcoma, and neuroblastoma, germ cell tumors, AML, we've gotten consensus of the international leaders to build these commons. It's not like there's another group that's gonna say you didn't include us. I mean, this with pediatric oncology, you can really do that. So that's been really, really important to our success, I think. Um, but this does serve as a paradigm across all cancers. There's nothing that we're doing that is not repeatable, not just among cancer. I mean, if somebody wanted to build a Crohn's disease commons, they could do that. In fact, I just helped prepare a proposal for uh, um, an epilepsy data commons. So, so these principles are, are universal. Data standards, data sharing, mm -hmm. aggregation, harmonization, these are all important to every single area. Um, and I think that, uh, that we need to keep pushing groups to share their data. And that's one thing that, that I've seen is, you know, five, six years ago, it was all about, I had my silo slide. It was all about people siloing their data. up, And it's almost like, um, I don't want to say we're guilting people into it, but I think the more people are putting data into our commons, the more that um, the, the more that people are willing to share. In fact, uh, take a group like St. Jude, which for a long time was very insular. They have so much wonderful data there. Uh, we're working with three separate groups of St. Jude now and getting their data into our commons as well, because they see the benefit of being part of this effort and they want to be part of it with us. Okay, so I've got a question as well. And a reminder, Let's see if I can point to it on the screen over here. There's a Q&A. If you want to click on that and ask a question, feel free and we can answer your questions. Um, Sam, you talked about the Center for Cancer Data Harmonization and you referenced commons coming together. How many commons are there? Yeah, so the, the Cancer Research Data Commons ecosystem plan from the NCI envisions probably um, it's probably close to 10 different data commons and data resources. So there's, there's an imaging commons that's up and running. There's an immuno cancer, so immuno oncology data commons that's, that's getting up and running. There's the proteomic data commons. The, um, there's a canine data commons that has uh, tons of data on um, uh, cancer in, uh, in dogs, which actually is really helpful for research. 
and you don't have to get a lot of consent. There's no HIPAA for dogs, so that makes the data very shareable. Um, uh, and then there's other things like the Gabriella Miller Kids First Data Resource, which some of you may have heard of, which is another uh, genomic resource for children's data. Uh, and then there's many other efforts that they're trying to connect to. So, so the, the challenge is though, is that each of these groups, each of these groups um, often thinks that they know the way that they need to share their data. And so, so our group has the, the difficult task of trying to herd all these cats together and get people to share data in the same way, which is not always easy. But if we have any hopes of, I'll give you an example. You may want to come in and say, show me all the kids that have neuroblastoma that were age 10 and under, that have CT and MIBG scans that were on this particular immuno-oncology agent. That needs to connect three different data commons, and you have to be able to have a, have a universal patient identifier, and you have to have all sorts of cool ways to connect the data. That's never going to happen unless we can get standards across these data commons. Anna, did you have a question? So I'll just say, you guys, it would be, if I know how hard it is to be in the place that Xana and Matt are right now to try to keep thinking of questions. So you guys could do them a favor by just coming up with something so that they don't have to keep pretending like they have a whole huge list of questions. But go ahead, Xana. Well, first of all, I will say that, and, and we are learning as we go, you can raise your hand and we can bring you on to screen to ask your questions. So that is capable. I, I see in, in attendees that we can allow anyone to talk. Um, so you don't have to type out your questions. That's always uh, a dampener for me. Um, but you were talking a little bit about HIPAA and dogs, and I wanted to ask you about privacy. Um, and mm -hmm. maybe now that right now in the news we're talking about contact tracing and, uh, and even data from wearables, where do you see sort of medical data and privacy going? Do you feel like it's loosening up, or do you think it's something we're going to continue to battle against? Um, I don't think it's loosening up. What I see happening more is um, uh, more focused efforts on making sure that the research can get done. And I think one thing that COVID has taught us is that, um, is that uh, when there's a will, there's a way to get this done. And the fact, that, the fact that in a very short six months, we were able to get COVID data common stood up in several places in the country, I think is a real testament to the fact that it doesn't take five years, that lawyers can actually negotiate agreements quickly and IRBs can actually review research quickly. So I think it can be done, um, but I don't think the privacy restrictions are gonna loosen up anytime soon. If anything, I think they're tightening up. I think we've seen a real pullback from the Europeans that are making it very difficult to share data, uh, mainly because of the issue of identifiers, as you said. Um, nobody gives us trouble on taking de-identified data and sharing it. Where we start to have problems is when we try to connect identifiers to data, which allow us to do things like connect it to other sources or update it. Um, that's when we start to see problems. So um, we're, you know, we have a full-time person that all she does is regulation and HIPAA and, and, and GDPR. And so, so she's, um, uh, she's busy, busy, busy doing data sharing agreements and working with lawyers. Okay, we've got somebody um, raising their hand, and so Jeremy, so I can I can go through them. I see him. Is that okay, Matt? Yeah, let me. The oh, first person. Oh, you want, so he uh, wanted to talk. So go ahead, Derek. Uh, hey, thanks. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Great. Uh, thank you. This is very interesting. So I'm curious about something. Uh, we know that some therapies, for example, checkpoint inhibitors cause some significant side effects for some people, such as the onset of autoimmune diseases, mm -hmm. uh, presumably as a result of the amping up of the immune system. And what I'm wondering about is what data you maybe will be looking for or, or might want to consider over time to help you understand which patients would have the, uh, the, the tendency uh, to mm -hmm. see such an event occurring, which we know is relatively uncommon, but it certainly is something that's happening, whether it's type 1 diabetes or other things. It's a great question. And uh, we've just been thinking about this a lot because we've, um, we're, we're trying to work with a group to develop some long-term follow-up um, data commons type initiatives where, um, where we can start to look at the long-term effects of some of these PD-1 inhibitors and other immuno-oncology agents. The problem, as you started to allude to, is that is that you're not looking for kidney failure. You're not looking for graft versus host disease. You're looking for things that are that are rare and, and you might not even know what you're looking for. So the idea in building these commons is that you sometimes need to collect a lot of different types of data that you don't even know are going to be important. Free text notes, 
uh, surgical notes, pathology notes, um, uh, uh, you know, lab values for things that you don't necessarily expect to be um, to be out of the ordinary. And so there's a real effort now to try to figure out how can we extract those data right from the electronic health record. So rather than have a ha have a trial where you have a form and collect data, you say, listen, we're going to collect all the lab values on these kids, or we're going to collect all the imaging on these kids. Now that brings up also consent issues and it brings up privacy issues. Uh, but the technology has now emerged that we can do that. And uh, to get at the kinds of uh, side effects you're talking about, Derek, we're going to need to really connect, collect large amounts of data and make yeah. it available for large scale like ML type research where you can look for things that you might not be expecting. I agree. Uh, and then uh, one other that maybe is opening up even a, a, a really huge amount of data potentially is family history. Right. Right, family history, um, which is also not easily collected, especially if you're um, uh, if you don't have access to the parents' records. Um, and then the other thing that we're also trying to collect is re is real world data. So you know, can we collect data on the environment? Can we collect data sure. from wearables? Can we collect data from you know uh, you know where they live and and geo yeah. you know uh, census exactly. tracking? So so all those things I think are going to be really important. In fact, we're writing a we're writing a U of Chicago grant now to study something that we've called the sociome, which is, you know, all the things that are not clinical ah. and can you collect those data and connect those to patients as well. You, you just taught me a new word. That's a good one. Thanks. I appreciate it. But yeah. obviously as we think about the phenotypic experiences and all that's important. So thank you. Um, uh, Jeremy is asking about uh, a fight or a disagreement over a standard. And um, my, my favorite example that I've actually mentioned in talks was, um, we, it was early on with the with the with the rhabdomyosarcoma folks, and we were we were we were in um, we were in Utrecht, which is outside Amsterdam, and we were having a meeting there with all the experts, the U.S. and the European. And we were it, it was very early at this, and and we so we were just new at it, and and we were talking about the sites of metastatic disease. And um, the U.S. had a list of about 20 sites of metastatic disease, and the Europeans had a list of about 100 sites of metastatic disease. So the U.S. had like hand. And then the Europeans had like finger, first finger, second finger, th like they was just so incredibly um, uh, intricate. And at one point we had a 20 minute discussion about whether cheek was part of face or was part of head and neck. And I, it was like the most surreal conversation. Um, and I, I remember like looking at it saying, did we just talk for 20 minutes about this? Um, and the way these things are settled um, is really through consensus because when it comes down to it, um, uh, if there's a scientific reason for doing something a certain way, we'll do it that way. And in the end, I think the Europeans in this case realized that that rhabdomyosarcoma of the upper lip is not different than rhabdomyosarcoma of the lower lip, even though they had those two separate sites, and we just merged that into, into head and neck or face or whatever we did. Uh, so I think science usually tends to rule the day when it comes to settling these disagreements. I have yet to see one that we couldn't ultimately settle with, um, with a little bit of consensus building. Um, and then uh, Tom's asking about how we search the data. Um, uh, it's very easy to search the data. We don't have a we don't have a, um, a voice controlled data search yet. But it's, but if you go to that uh, link that I had up before at the INRG database, uh, you'll see that you can register an account and you can just start searching over the data. It's very simple to do searches. What we're really excited about and what our what our four hour retreat was about yesterday was this next generation platform that we're going to be releasing. So we're actually leveraging the same platform that the Genomic Data Commons is on, and we're going to take all of our comments and put it into this. Uh, new platform which is beautiful and makes it easy to much easier to search and draw cool pictures and to look at the data model so uh, that's going to be hopefully coming out um, uh, in the first quarter of 21 so we'll be able to show you that but but our goal is to make it make it extremely easy to search over the data hi Santa you're still muted so as a follow-on question do you see patients um, or parents of patients accessing this data directly? And, and tell me what that would kind of look like. Yeah, so, so we had lots of discussions about this, you know, so um, there, was, there was definitely a group that felt like, um, you know, giving parents access to this data could somehow be harmful in some way or could somehow be d distressing or disturbing. In the end, I think we decided that, um, that there's no reason parents shouldn't be able to see that there's a large collection of data. Uh, and in fact, this concerned us so much that we uh, actually did, um, uh, we did a large survey last month. Uh, we sent it out to about 500 people asking for their perceptions about when their child had cancer, what they understood about their data, where their data went, how it was used, did they find out about their data, would they be interested in understanding how their data were used. And we're still, we're still um, 
we're still analyzing the results back. The, first of all, the open rate on that survey was incredible, uh, much higher than, we've, than we would have expected. Uh, and the response, responses have been really interesting. One thing I've noticed is that people really want their data to be shared. Um, but they like to know exactly how the data are being used or where it's being used. So I think these, having these data commons available for parents to use can only help people understand that these data are, are, are critically important and that, um, that by using the data, uh, we're able to make discoveries from it. Um, so I'm very supportive of this. We're actually, uh, we're in the process of setting up a parental advisory committee for our data commons so we can have, and we've had a couple very strong parent advocates um, that are um, that that are usually in the news when it comes to talking about uh, pediatric cancer, and so they've actually been very helpful with us in helping us form some of our policies. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, what is your budget? How how is your budget growing as you as you uh, continue to do this important work? And and how important is private funding um, as far as you know what percentage of that is of your budget and yeah, I think we we recently looked, looked at the breakdown and over half of our funding is is from private sources. I think it was over 60%. Um, and, and and that's really skewed by this these multi-million dollar grants we got from St. Baldrick's and Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Uh, but I, I see that continuing. I think the private sector has really seen the value because of all the business people that sit on the on, on boards like CRF and other groups. I think they see the value early on of data standards, data sharing, uh, harmonization, infrastructure. Um, and so I think that's been a lot of the sources of our success has been that these grants get reviewed often favorably by by just, I mean, to be honest, just people that understand business and want to make these things work. Um, uh, but we're starting to see some of the some of the dam break open at the government now. I think the CCDI uh, the CCDI has started to um, uh, leak some money into this. The, the million dollar contract we got was directly from the CCDI. And so we're going to start to see a lot more of these initiatives coming from the government. Um, but I, I, I only you know, I, I spend more of my time writing uh, foundation grants than I do government grants right now, because just the return rate is much better. Um, you know, and, and, and it just, you know, I get, you get to do a lot more talking to groups that appreciate uh, the work that you're doing, uh, and then you can establish these long-term relationships with groups. I mean, I've been working with St. Baldrick's for 10 years now, and thankfully they haven't asked me to shave my head again, just one time, but it, it may happen again. Um, but, um, but yeah, these long-term relationships we've established with foundations have been really meaningful to us. And Xana's um, CRF is our, for sure, our longest-term longest relationship. And is the budget, uh, how does the oh, budget change per yeah, year? Yeah, so, right, so we're, um, you know, our, our um, uh, you know, it, it, it takes about, um, about between two and $300,000 to get a data commons spun up in the first year. Uh, that's, you know, we, we, we found that, you know, that that's a repeatable number, that, that that's what it takes to have the, the data standards people, the data dictionary folks, the regulatory folks, the tech folks. Um, uh, and, you know, we can do it on a shoestring for less than that, but to really do it right and to get something that's stood up where you can search over the data and get data into it, that's the, that's the level we're talking about. So when we're looking at, um, we're looking at grants that have true impact at like expanding what we're doing, um, we're, you know, we're starting to go after multi-million dollar, um, multi-million dollar gifts now because, um, uh, because that's where we really feel that we can, we can go back to the group and say, we're going to have multi-year impact with, with the gift. Um, uh, I'll just say sustainability is an uh, ongoing issue. Um, uh, right now, researchers have free access to using our commons. If we give them data, there's no charge for giving them data. Um, I have to assume that in the future, there's going to be some either fee levied on the researchers or levied on the consortia. Um, and even though it's, you know, people don't want to talk about it, these data are really valuable. And to take the identified data and to, and to see if, um, to see if uh, pharma wants to buy it, I don't see why we should ignore that. I think there's a definite possibility that there could be monetiza monetization, as long as it's done within the strict governance that we've set up. Santa, did you have any questions anymore? Oh, I, I think that this is terrific, and I'm so glad to hear that it's growing so rapidly. Um, and that I really see this as something that is both forcing the government and also sort of l larger cancer groups, I mean, to recognize the need for it. So thank you, Sam, for always being um, on top of this. Yeah, it, it, it's um, it's great working with you guys. I'd love to come back and give you guys an update in uh, six to twelve months to show you what we've been doing. Um, 
hopefully, uh, Matt, I sent you my slides. You're welcome to send those around. Uh, there's a link actually on the slides. So you can download them yourselves. And in, in that one slide, there's a link to our, our neuroblastoma comments. So you can go in and there's no reason why you can't register and, and play around with the data yourself. And um, uh, and we're excited to roll out our new platform. Looks like there is another question from David about um, uh, uh, about uh, about machine learning. So I, so I have a whole separate talk that I give on machine learning in medicine, which is really interesting and fun. Um, uh, you know, everybody thinks that doctors are going to get put out of business by machines, and uh, you know, um, every generation people think this is going to happen. I think when CT scans and MRIs came out, they said the neurologists would be out of a job. When echocardiograms came came easy to get, people thought cardiologists would be out of a job. Um, technology just allows people to free up their mind to do other things. And so just because a machine is going to read an x-ray or read a pathology slide, um, that means that the pathologist can do other things. And it's not, and, and so, the, so the way that we work is changing, uh, but, um, but there's always going to be a need for humans and uh, machines to work together, and that's, and that's not going to change. So it's a really interesting time to be in medicine, but this trope is, uh, is repeated again and again. And I'm happy to come do that uh, machine learning talk sometime if it's interesting for the group. Or you could you could take one of my classes, or you could get a master's degree in biomedical informatics, and uh, we'll spend a lot of time together. Okay, and that is we're right uh, about on time. So as Zana said, I'd echo thank you, Sam, for um, spending time with us tonight, and thank you everyone for. Oh, do we have another question? No, David wants to get his oh, master's degree. Fine All right. Um, and we hope that you will join us. We've got another one coming up in later October that we'll be sharing information about very soon and then another one in early December. So thank you all. Thanks, Sam, Zana, and have a wonderful night. Be well, take care. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, bye-bye.